So folks, let me do this. Let me open up with a word of prayer and then we will we will go ahead and, and begin. Let's bow our heads, please. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, oh God, very thankful for this day as I know that we all are. Lord, the sun is out and that is a huge blessing for us. I, I pray that you continue to uh, dry your earth, Lord. Uh, very thankful for this Bible study, Lord, for the attendance, for the hunger, for your word, and certainly this book of Revelation, Lord. Uh, I, I pray in the name of Jesus that we all put on our spirit, eyes, and ears, Lord, and receive this day what you have in store for us. We do pray the Holy Spirit into our study, Lord, as we will read, Lord, and take it all in as if it is manna from above. We ask this always in Jesus' holy name. Amen. amen and amen. Uh, folks, I, I, I want to make uh, a plug, a reading plug uh, to you, uh, just for whatever it's worth. It, it's, it's not in any way related to our, our book study uh, this morning, but we are uh, approaching uh, the season of Lent, which is a 40-day period in many of the uh, Protestant and Catholic denominations as we are, are really thinking and praying uh, about our walk with Jesus Christ, having a, a penitent heart, uh, a spirit of repentance, coming to the Lord and recognizing that from dust we came to dust we shall return. So I, I, I'm always thinking in that time, uh, of course, about uh, our relationship with Jesus Christ and, and and take some intentional time for reading scripture and also a spiritual read that that's normally kind of my journey through Lent where I'm always uh, being challenged in my faith and and having that desire to grow in my faith so uh, a, a book and we're, we're all going to be very familiar of course with the movie but before it was a movie it was a book and that is the book Ben-Hur okay the book Ben-Hur now what is significant about that book okay is that while the story is focused on the character Ben-Hur his story is also paralleling, par paralleling uh, the, uh, the birth and the life of Jesus Christ as well uh, what you may or may not know about this book is uh, it, it was not even written in the 20th century, but actually right after the Civil War. There was uh, a soldier and man of faith who felt very led to grow in his own faith, and after <coughs> some pretty significant uh, theological and biblical <coughs> conversations with friends who were not believers, he felt led, his name is Lou Wallace, Lou Wallace, the author, felt led to pen this book called Ben-Hur. I, I have absolutely been fascinated by the book, and here's why. Of course, Lou Wallace in the 1860s and 70s did not have the wonderful invention called Google. So he was literally going to the uh, source material himself and researching and researching and researching. It is very descriptive, but in this in this book, wow, I, I have I have been very very moved. So just wanted to put that on your heart if you are looking for a good spiritual read that that is that is. Um, very descriptive uh, that can literally can literally feed you spiritually. I would recommend that for you. Okay, here's here's just another little tidbit that I found out. Uh, actually, that was the very first book Ben Hur that was blessed by the Pope whenever it was written. The very first book. So I, I, I found that you know absolutely fascinating. So for whatever it's worth. Lou Wallace, Ben-Hur, 
uh, I, I've been I've been enjoying that book, and I do believe that it is a good companion read, spiritual read to the Word of God for us in the Lenten season or any day of our lives. So, uh, Ted, if you would, sir, would you be my timekeeper again? And let's uh, okay, great. Let's uh, let's go to ten uh, forty, if that's if that's okay. Um, Thank you, folks, for for hearing me ma uh, for hearing me out. Okay, well, look, let let's get let's get right into our study. Uh, if you will allow me, please, I'd like to just recap by reading up into the point that we stopped at, and then we'll get into uh, our study right after that. So I, I'm I'm going to begin with a Revelation chapter one, verse one and then I will read through verse 10, and then we will get right into, right into the, the biblical and also book material. So this is uh, from the Apostle John, uh, who has received a revelation from Jesus Christ, and he is on, at this point, an island called Patmos. And it says this, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which, gave, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. The time is near. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even, they, even those who pierced him. And all of the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Verse 9, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of, Je patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And then verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. And that's where we ended, as of a trumpet, getting the attention of uh, what, what we will <clears throat> see is a revelation from Jesus Christ to the churches. So, let us move uh, right into now our book material. If you would, uh, join with me, page 9. By the way, does everybody have a book now? Because we do have extras. Okay, praise God. That's wonderful. Great. Okay, page page nine. <clears throat> let us let us go go through this uh, in its entirety here. So, uh, our our pre quiz as we <clears throat> are about to move into the text here. Just going through it. Which was the first church to receive John's letter? Okay, our choices: Ephesus, Pergamum or Thyatira. Okay. Question two. When John turned in the direction of the voice that he heard, what did he see? 
the angel of the Lord, seven golden lampstands, or C, the heavenly gates. And then three, who was wearing a garment, in quotes, down to his feet? John, the prophet of old, or the son of man? Well, let's get right into the text and find out here. So, if there is someone that feels led, uh, please, uh, would you read it for us? The, the one thing I would ask is that you just speak up and speak out for us, please, so that, so that we can all, all hear you. Saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, moving moving down here. Uh, what what does Revelation one eleven mean? Let let us get into uh, the context now. So, if you would, what what I would recommend, I, I've highlighted this part is is just to just to star circle highlight what what this what this particular verse means. Each of the seven churches receive the entire book. Of Revelation, not just a portion, not just a, a mere fragment, but it says here the entire book of Revelation. And as we find out in Revelation uh, chapter 2, verse 1, each also received a letter then from Jesus Christ Himself. Okay? So just to, just to make that distinction, okay? The entire book and also. A letter from Christ Himself. Okay, uh, let's um, let's go to uh, verses twelve and thirteen. Whoever feels led, go ahead, please. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands. One like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and gritted about the chest with a golden band. Great. Good. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that, Bill. Okay, turning over to page uh, 10, and then I, then I want to offer just a, a couple of other things that, that, uh, that I think are pertinent here. Top of page 10. Uh, what Revelation 1, 12, and 13 means. So the voice that spoke to John was that of Jesus Christ. Just to make that very clear uh, and very distinctive there, okay? Now, the seven lampstands is the first of 21 symbols. If you would, mark that, okay? But, because what we're going to be going through, what we're going to be reading through, okay, are multiple, multiple symbols and their meanings. And in my personal opinion, okay, if you, if you are not taking note, if you don't know that these things are symbols and that they have particular meaning, it, it, it's going to get very confusing, okay? It's going to get very complex. So I, I want us to be fully aware here. So 21 symbols used in the book of Revelation um, and represents then the seven churches, okay? Seven lampstands, seven churches, okay? You, you can circle that as well, please, okay? The King James Version calls them candlesticks in this verse. Interesting, okay? For those of you who uh, have a copy of King James, maybe you're reading in a King James now, check, check that reference there, but uh, it says candlesticks, okay? Now, the Son of Man is Jesus Christ, okay? Another biblical reference of the Son of Man, by the way, is Jesus referring to Himself as the Son of of God as well. Here, the Son of Man. It is Jesus Christ. Now, a cross-reference, cross and I think this is important too, Son of Man occurs in Daniel 
713 as well. Another text, Old Testament text, that is what we uh, call uh, an apocalyptic text. It is giving us uh, a sign, a vision, a revelation <laughs> of what is what is to come, okay? And, and Daniel 7.13 says this, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Okay, that's Daniel. Uh, going down the middle of the page here, it says, Jesus is dressed in the manner of a high priest of the Old Testament with a garment down to his feet and a golden band around his chest. So Jesus is, is, is often referenced as the high priest, okay, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords. So that is one of, one of his as the Son of Man, one of His duties, one of His responsibilities, one in which we can look at Jesus as a high priest. He is the fulfillment of that ultimate sacrifice, His, his own self, His own body. Okay, Alright, so it says here, middle of the way down on this page, this is confirmed in Daniel 5-6, which remarkably has a very similar description that says, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with the gold of Euphaz. Okay? His body was like burl, his face like the appearance of lightning, and his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. There is no doubt that this is Jesus whom John sees. Okay, just just if you would, just star that, take, take note of that. None other than Jesus himself. Okay, just a couple of things that, that I just want to mention here that, that struck me. Back uh, to the very top here about candlesticks, about lampstands. Just, just a thought as, as I was reading this. So, of course, in, in our church, in a multitude of churches, on whatever altar space there is, okay, on the sanctuary, in front of the sanctuary, we have candles, okay? We have candles, which are, which are a representation of the very presence of God, okay? We, we are lighting... Christ's presence into our worship, which if you think about it, is a message all in itself. When we light those candles, hey, the presence of God is here. We recognize that. We're not worshiping ourselves or some other God, but Christ and Christ alone. And I would also say this too, that when we're lighting that candle, when we light that candle, it sends a message out to the congregation, out to the believer, that we believe in Jesus Christ and in His salvation. So think of even the very simple thing as a candlestick, okay? As a as a candle stand, okay? Or or here, of course, it says lamp stand as having really important theological meaning. It being there. It being lit, okay, and with it being lit, it has a message. Now, the only catch to that is when the preacher forgets to put oil in the candlesticks and you go to light it and there's no flame whatsoever. Been there, done that, right? So your, your preacher always, between Rachel and I, we're always checking that oil, right, Rachel? That, that, is, that is important. So, even in the candlesticks, it, it, it has great meaning. Okay, let me go down and mention something else, okay? Just, just for, just for my, my own understanding, and I want to offer this for our understanding, too. Let's go down, whether you're looking in the, in the, uh, in the book here uh, or elsewhere, uh, that, that word 
euphaz, okay, that word euphaz, which is in the middle of page 10, okay, U-P-H-A-Z. Well, actually, it's pronounced euphaz. It's euphaz. So, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what that means. It was actually a gold bearing region. Okay, a gold-bearing region. Let me give you some scriptures here. Okay, it was mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 9. Okay, and then of course in Daniel 10, 5. A gold-bearing region. Now get this, besides those two scriptures, there's no mention of it in the Word of God. Okay, uh, no, no mention of it. Okay, so... Uh, it, it is okay. So think, think gold. So make make that reference to hey the the garments, the the adornment of of the high priest there of Jesus Christ. The other thing too, uh, I, I I have seen this word. I just didn't know the meaning was burl, b e r y l. There, middle of page ten in the book. Burl, what is that? It's a hard material. It is a hard material, okay? So it is, it is in fact uh, something that, that, that has a, a good, strong consistency to it. It's not something that is going to break easy, okay? It's sturdy, uh, it's strong. So, euphaz, okay, and burl, okay? All speaking about about the king, okay? So, uh, here, um, let's, uh, let's go now, all speaking, of course, about Jesus. So, let's go down to the answers, okay? And I'll read them and we can just uh, offer the answers together, okay? It says, Middle of page 10. Which was the first church to receive John's letter? Ephesus. That's right. Okay. Number two. When John turned in the direction of the voice he heard, what did he see? Seven, Seven golden lampstands. Which are what? What's that a symbol of? That's right. That's right. And the number seven is a perfect number too. Okay. Okay. Just... Just uh, keep keep that in mind. Number three, who was wearing a garment down to his feet? The Son of Man. That's right. So speaking about the church and speaking about Jesus here. Okay, well, well let's go into further detail uh, about Jesus and what he looks like. Uh, some very descriptive detail. Bottom of page 10. <clears throat> we'll read it in just a moment, but let's go through the uh, pre-quiz here. So how did John describe Jesus' hair? Okay, A, as flowing locks. B, as white wool. C, as bronze. Number two, how did John describe Jesus' eyes? As bright as the sun? As a flame of fire? As powerful as thunder? Okay, number three. Jesus' feet are described as fine brass, and his voice as the roar of a waterfall, the voice of many waters, or the blare of a trumpet. Okay, well let's let's find out. Let's get into the text. Uh, whoever uh, whoever fills the lid, please read verse fourteen here. <clears throat> his head and hair were white like wool. As white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His okay. feet were like oh, just, just that one. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. But that, that that's good. Okay. Well, let's look at it because there's 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 a lot there. So middle of the way on page eleven. Let, let's look at what Valerie just read here. Okay. So the white color. Okay, is very significant. And, and immediately where my mind often goes in terms of colors, okay, are, are two places in our own worship space, okay? And that is our altar, okay, and the pulpit, okay? So let, let, let's think about that just a moment, thinking about color. Okay, so the color white is very significant. It represents purity 
and the use of white in the description of Jesus corresponds directly and forcefully to the Old Testament description of Daniel 7.9. Let's take a look at that, okay? It says, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, and its wills like a burning fire. Okay. Another strong cor correlation occurs in Matthew 17 concerning Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, which is, which is this text here. And he transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as the light. And, and there's a gospel description saying that in fact it was a it was a blinding it was a blinding light. Okay? Alrighty. Uh, let's uh, let, let's go into further description. Fifteenth verse for us. Fifteenth verse. His, go ahead. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. Wow, wow, thank you, thank you, Paula. Okay, uh, again, a lot of, lot of deep meaning here, so let's, let's get into it here. So feet like fine brass symbolizes Jesus' ability to trample anything underfoot, okay? Fine means rubbed and polished an indication that Jesus has overcome his earthly trials of the Gospels. He is now, and, and I, would, I, I would highlight this, okay? He is now a polished conqueror, a warrior of the highest order. In addition, Jesus' feet has been compared to fine brass, symbolizes, uh, which symbolizes divine wisdom and judgment. So, that, that in itself right there, okay, uh, brings attention to we worship the Savior who is victorious. He is not defeated. The devil has not defeated him, but in fact he is, he is triumphant here. Okay, uh, let's see, the second full paragraph on page 12, it says, in Exodus 30, uh, 3830, and with it, he made the sockets for the door of the tabernacle of meaning, or meeting, the bronze altar, the bronze grating for it, and all of the utensils for the altar. The use of brass, as in bronze altar and bronze grating, is associated with sin sacrifices. Star, star, star that. That that is that is good. Uh, information there for us to to have and to know, and then and then here it says uh, last last paragraph there his voice of many waters signifies a power and an authority as that of the roar of a mighty waterfall. So, uh, Psalm Psalm ninety three four the Lord is on high he is mightier than the noise of many waters and then the mighty waves of the sea. Okay. All right, so let let's go to these go to these answers here, okay? Uh, and we we can just offer them together. How did John describe Jesus' hair? White wool. That's right. Okay. And what do we know about wool? Is it coarse or smooth? Very coarse, okay? Uh, ha having any wool clothing, uh, a wool blanket, you know, we also know that, that it certainly holds, holds the heat as well. Uh, number two, uh, how did John describe Jesus' eyes here? As a flame of fire, okay? Uh, and then number three, Jesus' feet are described as fine brass and his voice as the voice of many waters. Okay, so here's here's my my takeaway from this. Okay, 
that uh, the Savior, okay, is coming uh, to John, okay, as someone who is mighty, okay? He's not in any way half-baked, half-built, okay? There's nothing half or uh, even watered down whatsoever. This, this, is, this is the warrior king. This is the crucified and resurrected king, okay? So, so in a sense, John, John is taking all of this in, and he is seeing a very legitimate, okay, a, a very supreme being in Christ, okay? There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing there that even looks or remotely um, uh, signifies Christ being dead or defeated. Questions. I think this is a good, good stopping point for, for questions, for comments. Okay. Well, good, good. Well, and, and, and I hope too, I hope too that by us going literally word by word for it, I, I want it all to be uh, very clear, okay, very crystal clear, and all of it to be uh, explain to us. So that's that 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 is my that is my goal for learning and, and retention here. Okay, let's go right into Revelation uh, 1, 16 and 17 here. Uh, the pre quiz. Okay. What was Jesus holding in his right hand? Okay. Seven stars, seven candles, seven bolts of lightning. Okay. Number two, what was Jesus' con continence, okay, his appearance, compared to? Was it the sun? Was it stars in heaven? Or was it the universe? And then number three, what did John do when he saw Jesus arrayed this way? Uh, he fell dead at his feet. Did he faint? Okay. Uh, he became caught up in the spirit. Or C, he was temporarily blinded. What, one, other, one other thing I wanted to mention in uh, uh, the first question here. Uh, holding, uh, Jesus holding in his right hand. So the right hand, okay, or the right side of the king, earthly king, heavenly king. That, that is a, 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 a position, a place of power, okay. Position or place of power and authority. Okay, uh, so what wanted to wanted to mention mention that uh, just just uh, let me use this example. Uh, for instance, when there were uh, kings to be the hand of the king, okay, was really a significant position place. Uh, of power. So, same same thing. You, you you know, Jesus in his right hand, he is holding something. He is in a place, a position of power. But that's a that 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 is a symbol of power and authority as well. Okay, so let let's get into verse sixteen for a moment. Whoever feels led, go go right ahead. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Wow. Wow. Just uh, visualize that. Yeah, just, that's the just most for... beautiful verse I've read so far, and it you know, uses the um, techniques of repetition and alliteration. It's just absolutely exquisite. Right. Okay. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Okay. Wow. Yeah. It's 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 one of those that that strikes me as as well. So let, let let's get into it. Okay. What what does all of this mean? Let's let's unpack it. Okay. So the seven stars in Jesus' right hand is uh, the second of twenty one symbols used in the Book of Revelation. That two edged sword is the third symbol. Just, if you would, take note of that, star that, okay? All right, let, let, let's talk about this two-edged sword, okay? 
The two-edged sword is used in Hebrews 4.12 in a comparison to God's Word. Okay? Maybe, maybe you've heard a reference to the Word of God being uh, his, his sword. It, it, is, it is biblical. It is, it is Scripture. So let, let's go there for a minute, okay? For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, okay? It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Wow, okay? That's the Word of God. That's, that's the sword right there, okay? Um, nothing, nothing there that is, that is man-made, but, but certainly... God made, okay? Let, let's go further here, okay? The seven stars. Well, it's going to be explained in verse 20 as representing the seven angels of the seven churches, okay? An angel, think about this, okay? A divine angel, okay? Biblically speaking, was a messenger of some sort, okay? One who gave a message to the church. Okay. And their being in Jesus' right hand, oh, here we go, is a powerful statement that brings to mind uh, what Jesus said in John 10, 27, and 28, where He says, My sheep hear My voice, and I know them, and they follow Me, and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. And, and you, know, you know what's, what's, in, uh, what's important here? I, I, just, I just want you to go with me just for a moment. Hold your place in the book of Revelation, and, and I want to just make a connection for us to Jesus and the angels. They were very much... Connected, and in the Gospel of Mark, in the Gospel of Mark, uh, I want us to go to verse, uh, uh, chapter one, rather, uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter one, okay, beginning with verse twelve, okay. Th this is this is a shorter <clears throat> narrative about Jesus in the wilderness, but something struck me about this that I that I, I, I want us to look at. I'll, uh, I'll read this, uh, verses 12 and 13. It says, Immediately the Spirit drove him, that being Jesus, into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts. And the angels ministered to him. Okay? Jesus and angels, okay, very connected there, very, very involved with one another. So, just just wanted to make that make that gospel connection there. Okay, let's uh, let's go now to um, let's see. Well, folks, I lost my place here. Were we uh, middle of the way on page thirteen? Yeah. Oh, okay, gotcha. So, what uh, what what um, the scriptures say about Revelation one seventeen? Okay, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, "Do not be afraid, for I am the first and the last." The Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last letter in the Greek alphabet. Oh, okay. Let's see what that see what that is. Okay, bottom of page thirteen. John's overwhelming reaction to seeing Jesus has a twin account in Daniel ten nine that says this. Yet I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. Okay, let's take a, take a look here. The answers, top of page 14, 
uh, Revelation 1, 16, and 17. Okay, let's just say these out loud together. What was Jesus holding in His right hand? Seven. Which are what? That's right. Messengers. Okay. Number two. What was Jesus' countenance or His appearance compared to? The sun. Wow. Think about that. Okay. Number three, what did John do when he saw Jesus arrayed this way? He fell dead at his feet. He fainted. Wow. Wow, wow. Okay, wow. Powerful stuff. Okay, let's, uh, let's go now to Revelation 18, 19, and 20 here. Okay? Three quiz. Number one, what did Jesus proclaim he held the keys to? Okay. The universe, the gates of heaven, Hades, and death. Okay. Number two, Jesus told John to write things of the future only, the past, the present, past, and future. Number three, Jesus confirmed that the seven stars in his right hand were the seven churches, seven torches, seven angels of the seven churches. Okay? What did the scripture say? Well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and look at it and read it. Uh, who, whoever, whoever wants to... Um, to read, just go ahead and read 18, 19, and and 20, and then that way we can we can already have it read. Whoever feels led. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Write these things which you have seen, and the things which are, which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. All righty. Thank you, Ted. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's get right into it here, okay? Uh, bottom of page 14, what Revelation 118 means. So Christ verifies his eternal existence referencing his crucifixion and resurrection. Romans 6, 9 declares, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Here it is. Death no longer has dominion over him. And that is what we proclaim for every believer who professes Jesus Christ, okay? Now, okay? And when they are no longer here in a bodily sense, but spiritually with the Lord, death no longer has dominion over that believer. Death does not defeat. Death, Paul says, doesn't even have a sting, and neither does sin. So that's that's powerful stuff. Okay. Uh, what what the scripture says, uh, Revelation 1.19, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. What does that mean? Well, John is instructed in how to map out the book of Revelation, including John's eyewitness accounts. Okay? And then Revelation 1.20, what it says here, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the what? Angels. Angels, okay. And the seven lampstands are? That's right. Okay, Let, let's get into it here. There is no reason to suggest that the angels of the seven churches are anything other than than actual angels, supernatural beings. You can mark that if you would. Take note of that. 
Since Revelation 5.2 refers to a supernatural angel, it is wise to view the angels of the seven churches as actual supernatural beings as well. Okay? Beyond their supernaturalness, though, okay, I, I want us to know that they have they have a point. Okay, they, they have a point for existence. They 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 have they have a meaning, and that is that is a, a message. Okay, all right. So let's let's go to Revelation uh, one eighteen uh, through twenty. The answers here that we've covered. So what did Jesus proclaim? He held the keys to. Amen. Okay. That's right. Let let us stop there. I I want to I want to read this verbatim because I think it's I think it's important. What exactly does that mean? Okay. So if you happen to have biblical notes under your text, I, I think that's a wonderful thing, and it can kind of kind of help us dig a little deeper here. here. Here's what my biblical notes say about that very verse the keys of hell and death. It describes Christ's authority over, the, or over those who have died physically and over their present resting place, which will be emptied and destroyed at the time of the great white throne of judgment. So immediately, of course, we think about keys. Keys that unlock a house, or unlock a shed. There's there's a little more meaning in that, in that Christ is the one who has that ultimate heavenly authority to do what no man on earth can do and set the captives free there. Okay. Uh, so wanted to wanted to mention that. Okay, I, I think this is this is very good information here bottom of page uh, 15 so let's let's just read through it just for a moment and we can we can do some starring here and highlighting <laughs> so the church in Smyrna and the church in Philadelphia were considered to be the very good churches okay now I think this is important because it's very relevant today okay very very relevant today and basically, I'm going to jump ahead here and say that through Jesus Christ speaking to John in his revelation, he's saying, hey, look, you know, there are the good churches, they are honoring God, they are doing exactly what the Lord has asked them to do. And then they there there are, in a sense, I'm using my own words here, half-baked churches, okay, that are not doing, okay, what... Um, what they need to be doing in the name of Christ and the, the 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 mission and the commands of Christ. So we will get to that in a moment. But I thought, hey, look how relevant uh, that is for us for us today to hear for all believers for all churches to hear. So these were the good churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia. Okay, they were mainly composed of a heavenly persecuted. Now. now Take note of this word, humble class of people, okay? Faith and humility, it goes a long way in the church and in serving the Lord, okay? Very important describers there, okay? Let's continue, okay? The church in Pergamum believed in Christ, but openly, openly permitted other pagan doctrines full of opinions and interpretations that sometimes went against the very nature of Jesus Christ Himself. There it is right there. That's how relevant this is. Okay? It's tragic. It's unfortunate. But what's being preached from some pulpits is not the truth of the Gospel. It's not Jesus Christ. It's <coughs> modern day paganism. Okay? And, and, and it's so, so sad. But there it is, right there. And that's, that's another reason why this text is so, so relevant for, for our lives. Okay, uh, top of page 16 here, okay? The church in Ephesus was very strict in its teachings. There's that word, right? But, okay, here it is. But was falling away from Jesus and his teachings. 
there it is again. Okay? It was an indictment on the body of Christ then, and it certainly is today as well. Okay? Well, the church... Ma'am? Excuse me. Yes, ma'am. Does that mean that the church was strictly teaching things that were wrong, or does it mean they were teaching the right things and the people weren't listening? Gotcha. Gotcha. Great, great question. Great question. So as we get further into the book of Revelation, it's mentioned about the Nicolaitans, the Nicolaitans, that was anything but the gospel of Christ. So it, it was it was very pagan. So yes, there there were things that were being introduced into these seven churches and into the early church as well that John would say, you know, his critique was, this is not of Christ, right, right. So, so it, it, yes, to answer your question, it, it was anything but, but Christ. Um, but good, good question. Uh, so, very strict in its, in its teachings, but was falling away from Christ and his teachings. Uh, the second bullet point here, the church in Thyatira was zealous and enthusiastic, but still permitted Jezebel's heresy. And then uh, the third bullet point here, the church in Laodicea, Leo, Laodicea, let me see, Leo, Laodicea, thank you, Laodicea, and the church in Sardis, Sardis had memberships composed mostly of the ruling class and were thoroughly pagan in nature. There was a hint of belief in Christ, but the belief was not followed with Christ-like lifestyles. And, and that, that kind of points, uh, Carol Jean, to, to your question there as, as well. So we'll, we'll get into that further. So I tell you what, let's, let's move right into uh, chapter 22. Uh, let's, um, I tell you what, if, uh, if someone would please read chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, and we'll, we'll get, get right into it. Any, any readers? Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Okay, good. Thank you, man. Uh, so, uh, a couple of couple of things that struck me about uh, about this text here. Uh, if you will go back to what Valerie has read, verse four, man, they, that that just really really spoke to me. It says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. There it is, right there. Okay, Keeping, keeping Christ uh, as the first love, as the main thing. And then therefore, uh, where you have fallen, repent, turn, turn from that lifestyle, turn from that way. And, and do the, the first work. So that that, uh, that spoke to me. Okay, so uh, let, let's go through the pre-quiz here. Who is speaking um, as chapter 2 begins? John, the angel of the Lord, or Jesus? Number 2, uh, Revelation 2-4. What does Jesus say that they had left? Okay. First love. Okay. Number three, Jesus states that he will come unto you as a thief in the night, quickly, or before you can blink an eye. Okay, let's get right to it here. 
what Revelation 2, 1, and 2 means. Middle of the way on page 18. So the seven churches of Revelation were representative of all churches of the time. Just, just note, note that if you would, okay? All of the churches of that time. Here it is, okay? And I think this is a good litmus test for for the modern church here. Some were strong in their faith, okay, as we will see. Some so-so, okay, and what? Some were woefully, okay, what? Deficient. Wow, okay, wow. Strong, so-so, woefully deficient, wow. Okay, so let, let's get into a little context that's important. Ephesus was a major met, uh, met, uh, Thank you, thank you. Ephesus was a major metropolis. It was the primary commercial center of Asia Minor. And the temple of Artemis in Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was in Ephesus that Paul led many to Christ, and the church had grown into a powerhouse. Ephesus was also the location of Timothy's martyrdom under Emperor Domitian. As Jesus addresses each of the churches, he begins by pointing out positive traits that are pleasing to him, followed by what displeases him. He asserts that the fact that he is all-knowing with his statement in verse 2 where it says, I know your works. I know your works. And then Revelation 3 and 4 here again, and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. So what, it, what does this mean here? Well, leaving the first love of the church means a diminishing of the initial zeal the church had for the Lord and His ways. Though Jesus states that He is against the church for drifting, as is characteristic of the love of Christ. He is still there, supporting, or supportive rather, and ready to, to forgive, and I, and I think that's important uh, to note as well. Fallen away, okay. But what is God? What 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 is what is the character and the nature of God? Let let's remember that supportive and ready to forgive. Okay. So, a uh, bottom of page eighteen. It is also significant that Jesus says the church has left in quotes its first love rather than lost its first love. That's important too. Take note of that. Okay? Because that speaks to to the modern current church as well. Left, but not lost. Okay? Signaling the opportunity for the church to return to its original spirituality. Okay? So how do I make sense of that? We don't have to turn any further than to when the church was created in Acts 2. Okay? Acts 2, 1 through 20. When you have some time, go back okay, to that text, read over that text. What, what a transformational, powerful moment. That was the birth okay, of the church. Okay? all of these different peoples, all of these representations of the lands had come together for the festival. The Holy Spirit in tongues of fire come down, anoint the church, and ministry begins. There is zeal there. There is that first love that was there, that was created. Compare that, okay? Compare that text from Acts to what John is speaking about some of these churches that have lost 
that love. You can make those biblical comparisons there, okay? Return to its original, original spirituality, okay? That's important. All right, top of page 19, okay? The scriptures say in Revelation 2, 5, remember therefore for, uh, from where you have fallen, okay? Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand, which is a what? What's the lampstand? Okay. From its place, unless you repent. Wow, that's got some bite to it, okay? What does that mean? Well, Revelation 2.5 means Jesus is advising the church to remember its initial enthusiasm. Go to Acts 2. Enthusiasm there, okay? When uh, it put Christ first. He urges it to repent and to go back to the church's first works. He said, in quotes, remove your lampstand. That means to place judgment on the church and remove its representation at the throne of God. Now notice, okay, that Jesus uses the word quickly, okay, quickly. This urgency gives his warning also added significance there, quickly, okay, quickly, okay. Don't put it off, don't put it on the back burner, okay, but quickly, quickly, added significance. Some answers here, okay. Who is Jesus, or, or rather, who is speaking as chapter 2 begins? Jesus. 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 There we go. Okay. And, and, and again, I'm glad the answers are there for us, okay? Because often as we're reading through it and all of these symbols of there are, are there, okay? Who's speaking is important. Is it John? Is it Jesus? Okay. Jesus, Jesus is speaking. Number two, in Revelation 2 4, what does Jesus say that they had left? First love. First love. Okay, first love. Jesus states that he will come unto you quickly. That's right. Quickly. Very good. Okay. All right. We can get through one more. Okay, well, we, we can get right to it then. Revelation 2, 6 through 10. Whoever would like to read that, uh, please do. <clears throat> Revelation 2, 6 Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I was going to say the knee or Nicolations. Yes, sir. Nicolations were known for having devious lifestyles, and greedy and had false teachings. Oh, am I reading the right thing? No. no. Oh, okay. uh, chap uh, start with uh, chapter 2, okay. Robert. Six. Okay. okay. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolations, which I also hate. 2 7 is, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. One more? Uh, read through 10 for me, if you to would. The angel of the Lord is far right. These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. And do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days, and be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown. Wow. Okay. Woo! Powerful stuff. Okay. Alrighty. So, uh, pre-quiz here. In Revelation 2.6, whose deeds did Jesus say that he hates? Okay. Nicolaitans, sinners, the church in Smyrna. 
Okay. Number two, who would eat of the tree in the midst of paradise? All who believe, he who overcomes, or any and every one. The church of Smyrna was told of some, was told of some of them uh, would be thrown in prison by unbelievers, Satan, uh, Satan uh, or blasphemers. Okay. What is uh, what does Revelation uh, two six mean? Uh, after Robert has read it, so yeah. So let, let let's look a little further at these Nicolaitans. So although not entirely pleased with the Ephesian church, Jesus commends it for despising the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Uh, and and highlight this if you would. The Nicolaitans were known for having devious lifestyles. They were greedy and had false teachers among them. So Jesus didn't hate the individuals, but he did hate their deeds, okay? Now, let, let, me, let me just build on that a little bit, and I want to go to my own biblical notes here, okay? Uh, it says here in verse... Let's see, verse 6 of the text that Robert just read from. It says, The Nicolaitans were a heretical group that troubled the churches at Ephesus and Pergamos. Apparently, their teaching and practice were immoral, perhaps even idolatrous. Some church fathers connected this, this sect, sect with Nicholas. Okay? one of the seven elected leaders in the Jerusalem church in Acts 6-5. Okay, so, so there, there, is, there is a source. There is, there is an individual that some, some, of this, some of this behavior and thought uh, came from here. So the, the Nicolaitans. Okay. Uh, what the scripture says about Revelation 2-7 here, okay, what it means. So here, Jesus is calling for repentance. Anyone who overcomes is victorious. But the book of John gives us the definition of an overcomer. Okay? In 1 John 5, 4 and 5, Jesus defines a victorious one as a believer in Jesus Christ. Okay? So uh, highlight that. Mark, mark that. Because the world will give us definitions, okay, that are absolutely not biblical and have nothing to do with Jesus. But if you want to know the truth of Scripture, the truth of the Gospel, here it is right there, okay? A victorious one, a, a triumphant person is a believer in Christ. So when Jesus states in his verse, I will give to eat from the tree of life, He's referring to what? Eternal life. Eternal life. Okay. All right. Revelation 2.8. Okay, let's talk about uh, Smyrna. Let, let's talk about the, the makeup of, of what Smyrna is. Okay, so Smyrna was a major seaport. Okay. It was an inter, uh, industrial center known for making wine. It was dotted with many temples, with one dedicated to Emperor Tiberius. The people of the church were basically poor, yet there was no rebuke from Jesus for the church. Instead, Jesus extends comfort and support. The church believers uh, there were persecuted because of the menacing presence of the Romans and a large Jewish population. Because of heavy persecution, many were killed and many others became martyrs. And this explains Jesus' reassurance that He is the one who died and lived, giving hope to the church through eternal life. Giving them hope. Giving them hope. Even in the midst of adversity, of persecution, that, that is... That is the hope that we all have as believers, okay? Uh, that, that last paragraph, top of 
page 21, the church in Smyrna and the church in Philadelphia were not rebuked by Jesus. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna means to the messenger of the church in Smyrna. The messenger is not an actual angel, but a human messenger in this particular in this particular case. Okay, mm -hmm. um, let's. Uh, let, I tell you what. Let's go down to the bottom of page twenty-one here. So, what the what the scriptures say in Revelation two nine? Just to recap, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but a synagogue of Satan. Wow. Okay. What does that mean? Well, when Jesus tells the church that it is rich, he means what? Spiritually rich, okay? Highlight that, please. That that is that is important. Okay. So the Jews whom Jesus refers to are a particular group of apostate, one of or, or one rather who forsakes his religion. Jews, these particular Jews, or, or rather, excuse me, apostate Jews. Okay, period. This particular or these particular Jews were used by Satan as chief persecutors. Historically, an example occurred in A.D. 155 when Polycarp, a Christian bishop of Smyrna, was martyred. Many apostate Jews assisted in his killing by gathering wood on the Sabbath for the fire upon which Polycarp was burned to death. Wow. Okay. Take, take note of that date, just so that historically you've got a you've got a reference there and to that bishop's name Polycarp there okay and then what the scriptures say revelation 210 there bottom of page 20 21 do not fear of those things which you are about to suffer indeed the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you might be tested and that you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. So there is a reward coming here, okay? And it's this. Uh, the ten tribulation days are actually days here. Actual days. The crown of life, which is also referred to in John 1.12, here it is a prize for believers who persevere. So when we often think about the believer's great reward he or she has received, her reward, that is the crown of life, the crown of righteousness that uh, Scripture speaks about, okay? A prize. Let, let's go through the answers here and, and then we'll, we'll conclude. So in Revelation 2.6, whose deeds did Jesus say that he hates? <coughs> That's right. That's right. Okay. Number two, who would eat of the tree in the midst of paradise? Yeah. Ah, there you go. There you go. That's a good word for us today. Okay. Even in the midst of adversity, okay, of suffering and pain, he who overcomes. Who will eat of that of that fruit? Okay, number three. The church of Smyrna was told some of them would be thrown in prison by Satan. Satan, Satan himself wants to kill, steal, and destroy. Thrown into a prison. Captive. I think that is a good place to stop. So let's go ahead and just earmark that then and we will pick up uh, I'll do a little bit of recapping uh, in uh, chapter 2 for next week uh, okay uh, uh, comments questions I have a question yes ma'am okay in Revelation 2 8 to the church in Smyrna and in Philadelphia it says the messenger is not an actual angel but a human messenger so how 
does he interpret that from, say, the church in Ephesus, which he says is an angel? Let me say, I'm looking for any explanation of that. And maybe we can touch on that okay. next week sure and thing. also the Nicolaitans, uh, you know, like the Greek meaning of that word. Okay, sure thing, sure thing. Let me, uh, let me certainly research that. How did John... Any, uh, anything in anybody's biblical notes to speak to that? Go, if you will, go ahead and uh, ask your questions one more time. Oh, okay. Um, in Revelation 2, 8, whenever it speaks to the angel of the church in Smyrna, it also says in his interpretation, the church in Smyrna and Philadelphia, and he says the messenger is not an actual Smyrna. angel, right. which Smyrna. he said it's specifically an, an angel in Ephesus to the right. church in Ephesus. Okay. And then the Greek meaning of Nicolaitans. Okay. But see, on page 15, it says it is wise to view the angels of the seven churches as actual supernatural beings as well. Right. So it's kind of a contradiction, you know. Are they actually supernatural angels or are they Messengers human beings? of the church. And I think that's the. Yeah. Yeah. What her question is. Uh, so let me regards. let me do a uh, let me do a dig on that and see what I can come up with. And then the Greek of the Nicolaitans. Okay, very good. I can do it. I'm a visual. Not a problem. Okay, fantastic, so folks. Well, let me offer a word of prayer for us, and we'll, uh, we will go for it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I, I pray, Lord, that as you uh, send us forth this day, Lord, that we go not alone in this world. We go with you. We go with the power and the anointment of the Holy Spirit, Lord. What a blessing it is to be able to uh, get into your word to be able to grow from it, Lord. I pray that these seeds are planted and that the Holy Spirit water them, Lord, so that they can take root into us. What a wonderful blessing it is to be in the book of Revelation, Lord, mm -hmm. revealed from your son Jesus right to John and to the church this very day, Lord. Mm -hmm. Let us keep it close to our hearts. In all things, we give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Have a wonderful and blessed day, folks. Good to see you.